Good morning. Happy Wednesday to everybody. Thanks for spending a few minutes with me here this mid-morning we get together. We call it Coffee with PC, uh, but this week, like the next few weeks, I'll be drinking tea. As I mentioned last week, uh, one of the things I gave up for Lent was coffee um, as a reminder of the great sacrifice of Christ. And so I'm drinking tea, a little English breakfast tea today, trying to to get about my day. I hope your Wednesday is off to a good start. Um, I just thought I would share something that was in one of my Lenten devotions, not one of them, but the Lenten devotion I'm using this year, uh, you know, for this 40-day period of Lent. A lot of times you can find various specific devotions for it uh, online, uh, in book form, or even through the YouVersion Bible app. And so if you don't, if you're looking for a way to have a daily Bible reading and devotion time, there are a lot of great tools available. And I would certainly recommend um, finding something like that. And the YouVersion app is great. Um, this one is not from the app. I found it elsewhere and have been reading it. And the focus today, and actually for the last couple of days, has been on um, a, a part of scripture that I've always really appreciated. It's in Philippians chapter 2. Um, it's, the, the bulk of it is, is, a, is a poem or a hymn, some people think, one of the early hymns of the church to Christ. Uh, Paul is writing this to the church at Philippi, the place where he had been jailed. Remember, a Philippian jailer was converted to Christ after that miracle um, that released the bonds on Paul, uh, but after he was singing at midnight, but he didn't leave, and that gave him the opportunity to share the gospel with the jailer. He's he's converted, and now Paul is writing to the church at Philippi from jail, this time in Rome. Uh, so it seems to be an interesting association and connection there with this city and with Paul in chains. And yet, in spite of that, Paul's attitude, in fact, I think it was um, Charles or Chuck Swindoll that wrote a, a book about the book of Philippians saying its main theme is joy. It's where the, 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 the verse rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it rejoice comes from that in spite of his circumstances, Paul could write this with joy. And maybe this hymn to Christ is a little glimpse into the why. Um, if you have your copy either digitally or a hard copy like I have today, you'll notice in beginning in verse 6 through 11, most of the time the typesetting is not typical. Um, they usually have the indentations to indicate this is a more poetic section of scripture. Now, one of the, the things that, that sometimes can be lost in translating from one language to another uh, is certainly the rhyme and the meter. And we don't know what that would have been like uh, necessarily in our English reading to get the same sort of, of, of you know, emphasis and stress syllables that you would in this case in Greek, but nonetheless, they indicate by these indentations and this special way of, of typesetting it to say, hey, this is not just typical a letter writing. This is a more poetic or perhaps even, as I said a minute ago, a hymn. This may have been one of the, the hymns or the poems that the early church used to praise uh, their Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me, let me read it to you and then kind of talk a little bit more about it. It begins in verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So that's that's the setting. That's kind of the introductory, if you want to put a title on it, the attitude of Christ Jesus is what Paul is going to record in this next section. And this is, this is what the actual poetic section says. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, we have this, this beautifully picturesque way of describing Jesus, where it shows when he was on earth, his earthly ministry, those, those years when he, he walked the earth with us in that sense, that, that the kind of defining characteristic of his life was humility. That, that he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped or to hold on to. Thinking about the, 
the reality of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that, that Jesus is a part of that triune Godhead from eternity past in heaven before all the adoration of the angels as they cried out in praise to, to the, the God of heaven and earth, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at, at, at his eternity past having that reality. But when he comes to earth, all of that is gone and he was willing to let that go. It wasn't something he wanted to hold on to, to grasp onto, but he was willing to empty himself, making himself nothing, taking the form or the very nature of a servant. Um, this was the picture uh, that this passage and this hymn or poem paints of Jesus. And it is, it is sort of the opposite, I think, of what we often desire. If we were writing kind of the, the typical feel-good story, it's the humble beginnings to grand end and that, that we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and go. And Jesus starts as the grandest and greatest of all. God himself and he humbles himself and he's willing to do that becoming obedient even unto death the death of the cross that very uh, cursed death cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree is a scripture from the, the hebrew bible and so he bears that curse of sin for us so that we might know him but it, it does end it ends on a high note right he starts high with with god in heaven he comes and humbles himself and then it ends by God exalting him. And it's a beautiful poem. But, but I want to focus, and this is the part that this Lenten season kind of gets me and is a great reminder for me and for you, I hope, too. Just before that, um, right before it paints the picture of who Jesus is and says, you know, instead of this way, let your mind be the same as Christ Jesus. Verse 3, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but... In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look out for your own interests, but also the interest of others. And then it goes into, this is the attitude you should have, the same as Christ Jesus, who definitely embodied that when he was on this earth. He did not put himself first. He was willing to humble himself. He was willing to empty himself. And become that servant for us. I, you know, those those couple of verses are really, that's a hard challenge, isn't it? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing, if we just shorten it, say do nothing selfish. That's tough. I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a, let's be honest, it's a lesson we try to teach our two-year-olds, isn't it? When, when they have their friends over and they're playing with their toys, we don't want them to be selfish. We want them to be generous, to share, to, to play in that way. And yet, as adults, sometimes we, we can be very selfish as we, we kind of get into the, the rat race, as it's sometimes called of our life. We, we really become that way and we want to look out for number one. These are, these are cultural ideas that, that we're confronted with that Jesus and Paul here in this section is saying, are you willing to put those aside? Are you willing to put those behind? And instead of going that way, that, that typical run the rat race, do what you can to get ahead, do it what you want, do, you know, if it feels good, do it, whatever the phrases are you want to use that we're often bombarded with. So no, do nothing that way. Instead, how's this? Consider others better than yourselves and look out for the interests of others. That, that's, a, that's a hard thing to do. Um, it is a, we talked to the, the teens on Sunday night, um, the, the new study we found is called counterculture the idea of how is christianity counter to our culture well i'll guarantee you this kind of thinking this kind of acting this kind of life is counter to the culture we're in uh, and, and in this lenten season it seems like it's a very good reminder to to all of us that that as we consider and whether you're giving up something for not or however you're you're celebrating that seems like a weird word about lent but commemorating maybe is a better word this lenten season as we focus on the gift of jesus as we prepare our hearts for easter and and the message of hope and resurrection that's coming as we consider who he was and what he did and we sometimes in these devotionals you'll actually go through some of the the last days of his life and see him time after time emptying and humbling and putting others first in his life as the example let this mind let this attitude be in you 
that's, that's in Christ Jesus, the same as that of Christ Jesus. It is a challenge for us as followers of Christ to demonstrate his character. In fact, we're told that that's what's supposed to happen. Christian maturity, growing uh, closer to God and growing in Christ is, is sometimes described biblically as conforming to the character of Christ, that the character of Christ, this kind of character is growing more and more in us. He's the, he's the model, he's the example, and, and we are in our lives supposed to be mirroring more and more him. In fact, that's kind of the meaning of the word Christian. In Antioch, as we've been going through Acts, we know that that's where the disciples were first called Christians. And I think I said when we got there, I don't think it was necessarily a term of endearment. It might have been, oh, look at them. They, Christian means a little Christ, you know, like, like a, a little example. That's what they were. When the people looked at them, they said, we're going to call them Christians because they act so much like Christ, that that's what we're going to call them. And derogatorily, possibly, but also there, there would be a modicum of, of probably respect and marvel that these individuals would live that way. If, if we who claim Christ as Savior and Lord would live this way, doing nothing out of selfish ambition, um, in humility, considering others better than ourselves, not grasping on to things as Jesus did, what we think is, is, is rightfully ours, position or power, or whatever, and instead emptying ourselves and humbling ourselves, being servants, then what impact might that have? I know the impact Jesus doing this had on my life, it transformed it. it. It made all the difference in the world. It's why I am a believer in him. It's why I do what I do professionally. It's why I still am amazed when I pick up the scriptures and read them, no matter how much or how often I read them, at, at seeing the, the love and the grace of God demonstrated through Jesus, this humble servant who was the model for us. So that's my kind of Lenten encouragement as, as we're in this season of the year, and particularly as we'll see some sort of things around the, the, the greatest gift that Jesus offered, his own life on the cross. He became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Let's remember that example of humility and emptying himself and see if we might have that mind in us, doing nothing out of selfish ambition, but considering others better than ourselves. That's my challenge for you this week, this month. It seems like it's Paul's challenge for us throughout our Christian life. It's something we have to grow into. It's something all of us struggle with at times. Certainly I do at times, wanting what I want and when I want it and how I want it, especially in the consumer culture that we live in. But the challenge of the example of Jesus is will we be that servant? Will we consider others better than ourselves and find ways to serve them as the opportunity for itself as Jesus did for us. Well, those are my few minutes with you today. I'm going to go sit and finish this last cup of tea for the morning and get on about the rest of my day. I'm sure you've got a lot of stuff on your agenda as well, so I'll leave it with you. Love to see you. Um, on Sunday, if you're in town here in Key Largo, love to have you worship with us. 9 a.m., First Baptist Church, Key Largo, mile marker 99 is where we are. Uh, love to have you join us as we finish up this Sunday, uh, kind of a look back at some of the lessons I've learned as we've gone through the book of Acts. That's on the agenda. Hope you can make it. If not, maybe we'll see you next Wednesday. Take care.